Uh, thank you. It really is indeed an honor and pleasure to be here. And uh, my biggest uh, claim to fame is leading one of the very best departments of urology in the nation, currently ranked fourth. It kills me we're not ranked number one, but I think we'll get there. And we have the number one recipient of NIH funding, so we have a strong commitment to uh, uh, research and education. And I lead, or I help lead, a, a talented faculty of men and women where patients come from around the country to see them for various disorders. So it's really been uh, an honor for me to be chair of this department. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I think you need to know about the prostate, about the prostate gland. And there are going to be three diseases that I go through. Uh, the presentation is, is relatively streamlined and brief, so I we'll have a lot of time for questions. And I think Jeff would like the questions at the end for production purposes. So the first thing is, what is the prostate gl gland? The, the prostate gland is a walnut-shaped gland that sits at the base of the bladder. It, the, its importance, it surrounds the urethra, the tr tube that takes the urine from the, from the bladder to the outside. Its function is it produces fluid that transports sperm during ejaculation, so it's important for fertility. Uh, it's important to, to realize that the, the prostate gland is, sits uh, very close to many important structures, including the erectile wall, the nerves that control sexual function. So when you treat the prost uh, prostate gland, you have to be care careful about collateral uh, damage. There are th three really important diseases. Um, benign prostate enlargement, we call BPH or prostate uh, BPE, prostatitis, and prostate cancer. And I'm going to go over th each, each one of those. And these are very common. Uh, disorder. So for benign prostatic hypertrophy, uh, this is very common. What happens over time, what I'm showing you here, so th this is a normal bladder, stores urine, and it empties uh, when men are younger, middle life, they can empty the bladder very easily. The prostate gland is, is relatively small. As men age, the prostate, cl uh, prostate gland does two things. One, it, it develops an increased tone, muscle tone, and it enlarges with time. So it constricts the urethra, think about a hole through the donut. So it constricts the urethra, and then the bladder has to work harder to get the urine out. So what happens is the bladder becomes thickened and starts to develop what we call a residual urine volume. And this is what accounts for the symptoms of uh, BPH. So men may develop frequency, nocturia, getting up at night, reduced force and caliber of stream, interrupted or intermittent stream, and incomplete emptying. And actually, I have a little. Uh, symptom score sheet you may want to pass around here, which, which allows men to actually quantitate their symptoms in a very well-validated way. You might just pass those around for people if they haven't seen that before, but you can f take a look at that and see. So the, if you look at age and incidence of BPH, it becomes very common. You can see a steady increase in the incidence as you uh, men enter uh, midlife as they get older, peaking around the mid-70s uh, to 80s. Prevalence, the same thing. As men age, uh, uh, again, a low frequency of prevalence of benign enlargement uh, for men in their 40s, increasing steadily as men enter their 70s and 90s. It's a very prevalent disease. And many men, I think most men will complain of some symptoms, and a lot of men will complain of significant urinary symptoms. And it becomes very bothersome. As you look at that score sheet, what this score sheet allows you to do is you rate function, you know, your symptoms, and actually something called a bother score. How, how bothered are you by these symptoms? So it becomes a very good guide to, to determine who has symptoms and how much they're bothered by it. And you can make treatment decisions based on that. So if you look at the so-called AUA guideline, American Neurology Association guidelines for evaluation, the most important things are just a relevant medical history, including this uh, form right here. Uh, and a physical examination to determine whether a man you, de to, uh, you could detect an enlarged bladder or, or prostate uh, gland. A lot of symptoms as a man had previous injury, urethral instrumentation is important to find out because that can cause uh, these same types of symptoms. And really the evaluation is very straightforward. This the symptom score sheet is the baseline evaluation, frequently accompanied by a urinalysis to be sure there's no infection. And sometimes measurement of what we call post-void residual, which is very easy to do by a simple ultrasound. So the office evaluation of benign enlargement is very straightforward initially. Now, there are some cases in men who are in full retention, can't go at all, bladder stones, bleeding, kidney failure. It used to be that this was a, a major cause of morbidity in the Middle Ages because they had, they had no way to treat this. So when a man went into retention, that was a death sentence. And, um, and it would lead to renal deterioration because they could not pass the urine, the kidneys would back up. Uh, so we still see these cases every now and then 
uh, where men are significantly uh, bothered and, and, and become uh, go into retention. Frequently, it's just due to some kind of um, event. They get out of it. On occasion, it's long term. On occasion, we'll do. We'll have to do more complex studies, and these are really. Uh, the unusual cases where we can do very complex, we call urodynamic assessment, where we can actually check how the bladder, sphincter, and prostate are working. But those are, are really, those tests are used for the problem cases. On occasion, we'll look at prostate volume by ultrasound as well. So again, the evaluation is very straightforward. Uh, uh, history, urinalysis, this uh, score sheet, and frequently post-void residual allows you to begin treatment or, or don't treat uh, prostate uh, enlargement. Uh, now, in the symptom score sheet, uh, low score is 0 through 7, moderate score is 8 to 19, and a high score is 20 to 25. So again, it's very straightforward. And then you ask this question about quality of life, that if you had to maintain your symptoms this way, would it be a bother or not? And I'm always impressed on, for some men who have very high symptoms, but very low bother, and some men low symptoms, very high bother. So yeah, actually, this whole issue of quality and, fun uh, and uh, bother scores are very important. Now. These are most commonly treated with medication, uh, and sometimes I'll show you some surgical procedures. But importantly, there's a lot of uh, we call behavioral therapy that one can consider before doing anything, certainly for the man who's got uh, mild to moderate symptoms. And one is timed voiding, that, that you get in the habit of not waiting until your bladder becomes very full, but void at the first urge. Fluid restriction by bedtime. One of the most common complaints of men is this idea that they have to get up at night. And of course, getting up at night and it's dark frequently leads to falls and other things. So this issue of restricting your fluids past uh, uh, a dinner uh, will allow the bladder to become less distended. Some things are irritants. Frequently, some patients find caffeine or alcohol irritants. If you, if you do, you may want to restrict those. Limited use of decongestants or antihistamines because these drugs actually weaken the bladder wall. So it's very common we'll see a person who gets a cold, has benign symptoms, and their symptoms are exacerbated when they take the antihistamines. So it's important uh, for you to understand that. You know, interestingly, uh, I, I'm, my specialty is oncology, and a lot of our work is looking at the impact of lifestyle on, on uh, malignancies. Eating a healthy diet and stay active uh, is an important rule for all patients. Uh, obesity is a comorbidity of BPA, so patients who are larger actually have a higher risk of uh, the symptoms we call low urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH. Pelvic floor muscle training, you know, these Kegel exercises have become, uh, for, for both men and women, uh, a um, common thing to do. And there's some evidence that uh, doing Kegel exercises may also be effective. Uh, effective. We actually developed a uh, free app. If you have an iPhone online, you can get this. It's called Kegel Nation, uh, both for men and women. It's a Kegel exercise you can, you can use on your iPhone. We're actually doing a randomized trial of, of this intervention for men with uh, uh, prostate cancer, but actually we were doing it in a lot of different situations. Again, men and women, it's called Kegel Nation. Hopefully, you'll give it five stars if you go to the app store. We're making no money out of it. It's uh, completely free. Uh, there are two classes of medications. So when you have benign enlargement, we nowadays don't go to, to surgery right away. At one time, surgical therapy was the mainstay of treatment of benign prostate enlargement. But over the years, we've developed effective medications. So now, most all patients, except if there's unusual patients, inner retention, large stones, bleeding, will be tried on medications first and only go to surgical therapy should they fail medications. Now, there's two important classes of medications. One's called alpha blockers. These are medications that allow for relaxation of the muscle at the bladder, neck, and in prostate. Now, alpha blockers are frequently used for many other things like hypertension. But there are some of these that have been developed that are more specific for the receptors that uh, sit in the prostate and uh, bladder and neck, the most common of which is something called tamulosin or Flomax, but there's a lot of different ones. I list them here. Uh, and these are kind of a first-line therapy because they're relatively quick to act. The, the, uh, usually it's one pill at night. The side effects, uh, they're, they're very effective for small or moderately enlarged prostates where actually the tone of the prostate is quite important. They have a relatively rapid onset of action. You'll know within 7 to 14 days whether doing something's uh, working. They can be associated with low blood pressure and something called retrograde ejaculation, where the ejaculate volume does not go to the, goes out but goes to the uh, inside. It has no uh, medical consequence, but it can be surprising to men, and it's something we, uh, we mentioned, because it actually relaxes the bladder neck. 
the other big class of medications are these we call valve alpha reductase inhibitors, the Proscar and Avidar, finasteride, nutasteride. These are agents which actually reduce prostate volume. So they reduce prostate volume by about 20 to 30 percent. They do so over six to eight months' time. They're, they're effective over in larger glands and actually used in combination with alpha blockers, as I'll show you. They can be associated with sexual side effects, breast tenderness. And there are some concerns, even though these agents have been used as we call chemopreventive agents. So when you take these agents, you lower your risk of getting a prostate cancer. But what they found was that the men taking these medications, even though they had a lower risk of getting prostate cancer, they appeared to have a little higher risk of higher grade disease. A lot of controversy. It turns out that 30 years survival rates are no different than those who took the placebo, but again, it causes some concern among patients. Although, if I have a patient who's got a large prostate symptomatic, I have no problems using it. It does, cre it does decrease something called serum PSA levels by about 50%. I'm going to get back to that because that's important for prostate cancer uh, screening. I can show you a lot of graphs. I'm not going to do that tonight. But this is just one showing the, 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 what they're doing here is a cumulative incidence of progression. That means for men who took these drugs, what's the likelihood that they develop either severe symptoms over time, urinary retention, renal insufficiency, incontinence, or recurrent urinary tract infection. So the men on the placebo, again, the, the sugar pill had the highest risk of developing these symptoms. And then you looked at the, uh, there were men who took finasteride alone or uh, the alpha blocker alone, about a similar reduction, but the men uh, who took the combination had the lowest risk of progressing, their symptoms progressing. That was really confined to the men with larger prostates, so it really the effect was not as seen in the men with smaller prostates, where either uh, where the alpha blockers worked just fine. If we looked at a reduction in prostate volume, that actually really occurred only in those men who were taking finasteride or placebo, but yet, Again, you see no change in prostate volume in the men on alpha blockers, but, but still they benefited by the medication. So again, smaller, moderate prostate, alpha blockers alone, larger prostate, probably a combination of the two. We usually start with an alpha blocker to begin with and then add uh, the second medication, the valvoff reductase inhibitor, again, finasteride or nutasteride, depending on a man's response. A very interesting thing, you know, is, is anyone who watches football games knows there's a, there's a big interest in the management of uh, erectile dysfunction in men. So, you know, uh, the, one of the most common medications uh, is uh, Viagra, which, which still ranks, ranks very high there in a medication that's widely utilized. It's interesting that both uh, erectile dysfunction and lower urinary tract symptoms are quite common. So erectile dysfunction in men over the age of 45, between 12 and 47 percent of men will have moderate or severe erectile dysfunction. And as I mentioned, lower urinary tract symptoms occur up to 81% of patients. And it turns out that men with lower urinary tract symptoms are three times more likely to have erectile dysfunction. So they're, they're related. Uh, and there are various theories about this, about uh, nitrous oxide. I, I'm not going to go through all the theories, but there's a good amount of science suggesting why they may be related to one another. And it may be related to blood flow and smooth muscle tension were dysfunctions in both, uh, both um, lower urinary tract symptoms and erectile dysfunction are, are, are major events. And the makers of Cialis n f uh, noted that Cialis is one of the longer acting uh, medications, and they noted that the men who were taking the drug, their lower urinary tract symptoms uh, decreased in taking the drug. These, these men were taking it for uh, erectile dysfunction. And if you look at men, the, the, in green here are the men that took the Cialis, again, it's one of these agents for, uh, to manage sexual dysfunction. That was his primary purpose. The men who took that had a nice change in their scores. Now, a lower score is better. So those greens going lower show that the men who took the medication did better. And uh, again, it's the thought that it increases blood flow and, and decreases smooth muscle tension, something that's important, important for, for men's erections as it is for uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. And it turns out that not only did it improve the, the lower urinary tract symptoms, but the men who had sexual dysfunction had actually improvements in, again, another score which, which rates uh, a sexual performance. And again, a higher score is better. So those who took Cialis actually uh, did quite well. So if I have a patient who reports that he has both low urinary symptoms and erectile dysfunction, this is frequently a medication I'll try. Sometimes insurers won't, uh, won't reimburse for it, although it, is FDA, it was approved by the FDA in 2011. So again, Cialis, five milligrams per day can treat both erectile dysfunction 
and low urinary tract symptoms. So I guess the, the patient who's ideal for this is a patient who, who has probably a small to moderate prostate enlargement, complains of both erectile dysfunction and uh, BPH, low urinary tract symptoms. So indications for surgery are failure or intolerance of medical therapy. So if, uh, many men do well initially but do become intolerant uh, or uh, have side effects. Certainly the absolute indications of those men who have renal failure, recurrent infection because they can't enter the bladder, uh, complete urinary retention, they can't go at all, bladder stones, and bleeding due to benign enlargement. Although if I say a patient who's got bleeding due to benign enlargement, a very good drug for that is actually the finasteride or dutasteride because it decreases blood flow as well. Uh, I can't go through, the, it, it is amazing to me, you know, my father-in-law was a urologist and, and uh, when he was in practice many years ago, you did either open, we call open prostatectomy or something called transurethral resection. Those were your two options. But nowadays, we have probably somewhere between 12 and 15 different options. I'm not going to go th through all of them with you, but I'm going to give you some idea of what those options look like. They all work, uh, some work uh, more than others. The most common one, it's very rare that we do something called an open prostatectomy where you make an incision and you take out the central portion of the prostate. Because what you're trying to do here is just open up that channel. Again, think of a hole through the donut. You just want to make that hole larger. The, the most common way to do this in the past has been something called transurethral prostatectomy, where a, a urologist puts a, a scope through the penis into the urethra and kind of cores it out, just like coring out an orange. What you're doing is you're taking out the flesh part of it and keeping the capsule intact. Um, the, the, uh, it's a very, very effective operation. What I'm showing you here is a decrease in symptom scores for men before they had their prostates resected to afterwards. A very significant reduction and improvement in symptom score. Again, lower is better. So it's a very effective operation. Uh, it can be associated on occasion with bleeding, uh, we call retrograde ejaculation. And because you're, you're doing this when you're, you have to do this, you're inserting a lot of fluid in because you have to keep an open working space. It can be associated, some men can't absorb fluid. Uh, now this can be done uh, with something called a bipolar electrode, which allows for a better control of bleeding. So instead of a standard electrode, you can do bipolar electrode, which has a lower d uh, risk of, uh, of uh, bleeding. Uh, another one is something called, become very popular, is a homium laser nucleation of the prostate. There's a lot of ways to use laser doing this. It's the same thing again. You're going in there, and what you do is you're nucleating the prostate. You're taking out that central piece. This is quite nice because the laser uh, actually results in very good coagulation of, 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 uh, of the blood. So the wavelength is such that it actually is very good in patients actually who are on blood thinners. So it's associated with a lower risk of, of bleeding compared to the standard transurethral resection. And I think especially for large prostates or men on anticoagulations, this uh, homium laser we call HOLAP is a very good uh, option. Just to show you that, that there's a lot of innovation, uh, a recent one that we're using here at UCSF is using water vapor, uh, where this is done in, in the clinic under sedation, but what's happening here is, again, you're just looking at the inside of the prostate, you put this probe in, and your, uh, w this vapor is injected into the prostate tissue, causing cell death to the target area. And then what happens is the, the tissue sloughs over time. These patients, again, it's, it's an outpatient procedure. These patients can have a, a fair amount of frequency early on while the tissue is, uh, is sloughing off. But again, a, a, a becoming a more and more popular option because it could be do, done as an outpatient procedure. And again, this just shows you, again, I'm not gonna show you a lot of graphs, but again, in this here, again, the lower numbers are better, and you see in blue, they're the people who got the, um, the water vapor. Their urinary flow improves significantly. Lower is better, and their flow, again, on the uh, opposite side uh, is higher. Again, higher number is better. So again, compared to placebo or control, we say these men did much better. And the, the, uh, it lasted, it, we're, here we're going out to three years' time, all these different subdomains lasted. It's interesting, these two that don't seem to get quite as, as, as a, a big reduction in symptoms are this issue of frequency and uh, getting up at night. What happens to the prostate, when the prostate gets large, the bladder has to work harder, so it gets thicker and becomes a little bit unstable. And even though you may remove the obstruction and improve urinary flow, some of that irritative symptoms may persist because the, the bladder has had to work so hard against an obstructive prostate for a while. Sometimes it doesn't gain the compliance it had uh, when men were younger. But a significant improvement that appears to be relatively durable. 
In closing, I just want to show you one interesting one. It's something called a, a, a prostate uh, urethral lift. This is something where uh, a urologist goes into the prostate and puts these little tines in here. And what here is, is doing is simply this little wire here. You have a, a piece at one end and the other. What it's doing is simply opening up the prostate. I wouldn't have predicted this would work, but it actually works quite well, especially for smaller prostates. So these, these are just, you're, you're just stretching open the prostate with these, these little, uh, little uh, implants. Actually, this, is prefer this procedure and the resume or the water vapor proceed, uh, uh, often preferred in men who want to maintain what we call normal ejaculation because many of the procedures open up the bladder neck so the ejaculate volume instead of going out uh, goes back into the prostate. It can be disturbing for men, some men, not others, but this one seems to preserve what we call so-called anti-grade ejaculation. So my approach in closing for benign enlargement is measure your symptom score. Again, you, I pass them around, but you can get them online. If you just look at something called AUA symptom score, it's online. You can look at it, find out what your score is. Uh, if it's low but bothersome, I would consider behavioral therapy. I wouldn't take medication. I wouldn't consider surgery. Again, time voiding, avoid bladder irritants, pelvic floor exercises. If you have moderate to high, I would consider medical therapy first. I would not go to surgical therapy. I'd try, try medical therapy first. Again, I would start with an alpha blocker. Again, I showed you six different ones. The common one is this Flomax. I'd start with that. And I consider adding a foul buffer reductase, again, finasteride or utasteride for those who have larger prostates, something called combination therapy. And if uh, you have symptoms, you're sexually active and suffering from rectal dysfunction, I might consider daily dose Cialis. Uh, if you fail medical therapy, uh, I would consider surgical therapy. Interestingly enough, a lot of men who fail medical therapy don't go to surgical therapy. They kind of manage their symptoms. I think if you fail medical therapy, I go back to behavioral therapy and really see what impact it has on your life. I think you have severe symptoms. You have to be a little careful because what you don't want to do is find yourself going into retention. So you want to manage the problem before you develop severe symptoms. Uh, the second prostate disorder is something called prostatitis. This is an inflammatory condition of the prostate. Now, interestingly enough, so the prostatitis is an infection or inflammation of the prostate gland that it presents as several syndromes with varying clinical features. I'm going to go over those with you. But interestingly enough, about 8% of men have prostatitis at some point in their lives. And there are four syndromes. We call acute bacterial prostatitis, again, a, a, an acute infection usually with a bacteria. <coughs> Uh, something called chronic bacterial prostatitis, where the recurrent symptoms frequently the absence of a, of a known bacteria. This is the most common type, frequently precipitated by uh, acute bacterial prostatitis sometime earlier in life. Uh, we have others that can be much difficult to treat, something called chronic prostatitis and chronic pelvic pain syndrome. This can be very debilitating, very difficult to treat, and it's further classified as we call inflammatory or non-inflammatory and there's something called asymptomatic inflammatory prostatitis, which I think is a pelvic floor problem that's not related to infection. Uh, these symptoms can be insidious. It's frequently fever, chills, malaise, arthralgias, uh, muscle aches, uh, frequently perineal pain, you know, pain low down in the prostate areas, dysuria, difficult, uh, pain on urination, lower urinary tract symptoms, frequently low back pain uh, or low abdominal pain as well. I think if you, uh, if the, uh, and these you make a diagnosis looking at the urinalysis and on occasion the prostate secretions themselves. So if you, you have a patient who you think has bacterial prostatitis, again, this would be high fever, a positive urine culture, these men need, uh, uh, they, they need antibiotics to, to take care of bacterial therapy. Frequently drugs that have high penetrance into the prostate, fluoroquinolones, which we don't use quite as much anymore, but combinations of something called trimethoprim sulfa. For the more chronic type, uh, it's frequently a combination of antibiotics, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, uh, and alpha blockers. I think for those patients who develop chronic pelvic pain and the absence of a, of a clear urinary tract infection, these patients should be referred to specialists who uh, I think can manage these patients with a, a greater specificity. Um, but it's important that you manage it effectively early on and try and avoid uh, recurrent symptoms. It can be debilitating. One of the most controversial Disorders or cancers uh, in the U.S. and around the world is prostate cancer. Uh, it's, a, it's a very common but very controversial cancer, and still the controversy continues, and I'll go over that a little bit. Uh, we, have, we get about 165,000 new cases per year in the U.S., uh, and it accounts for about 10% about of all new cancer cases in men. 
Uh, it does account for about 30,000 deaths per year, about, about 5% of all deaths. The lifetime risk of prostate cancer in a man born in the U.S. today is about 1 in 10, very similar to breast cancer in women. Um, and there's over 3 million men living with prostate cancer currently in the U.S. It's more common in men, uh, it's more common in men with a family history of prostate cancer and more common in African-American men. In fact, one of the highest incidences of prostate cancer in the U.S. is over here in Alameda County in African-American men. Uh, we have an international reputation for the study and management of prostate cancer, and it's something we've looked at over time. What I'm showing you here is new cases uh, uh, in, in yellow here over time from 1975 up until the t mid to 2015, and these are the cancer deaths rates. You see a little blip right here, a, a big blip in the, the uh, incidence of cancer that occurred in the late 80s, early 90s, and this was because of an introduction of a test called prostate-specific antigen. So prostate-specific antigen is a protein secreted into the bloodstream that can be measured, and it, it, the, the um, the level of PSA correlates with both benign enlargement and prostate cancer. So this test became widespread there, and there was a big increase in the detection rate of this disease. It sparked a lot of controversies about whether it have value, which I'll go over. And uh, the interesting thing is we've seen each year the death rates due to this disease decline substantially in the U.S. So the death rates uh, declined by about 30 percent and continue to decline both in African-American men and Caucasian men. So all uh, racial groups are benefiting by, um, by early detection strategies. Uh, for prostate cancer, the majority of cases are detected early, so about 78 percent are clearly localized to the prostate. This is entirely different. If you looked at this slide for men in Asia or Africa, totally different. Uh, probably related to a lot of different things, certainly less screening in those countries, but there the patients more commonly present with high-risk disease, disease beyond the prostate. So in this country, the outcomes, you know, the five-year survival, five- and ten-year survival rates are excellent. You go to countries in Africa uh, and Asia, it's a much different category. We do a lot of research with colleagues over there. Now, a lot of controversy. In 2012, I, I, I showed you there was a dip that occurred about 2012 in detection rates for prostate cancer, and I think we think the reason for that is the um, U.S. Preventive Task Force, which is kind of the task force for recommending uh, guidelines for de detection of all kinds of things or management of hypertension gave this a D recommendation. It said you really shouldn't do screening in men uh, with serum PSA. And they did it for two reasons. There were two large randomized trials, one in the U.S., one performed in Europe. Uh, the one in Europe showed a benefit to screening with PSA. That means the people, there was a, a greater likelihood of dying of disease, uh, anywhere between 21 and 28 percent decrease. Uh, deaths due to cancer, prostate cancer, men who underwent screening. In the U.S., that didn't occur. There was no difference between screening and no screening in the U.S. population, and that got their attention. So they get this de-recommendation. The other thing they found was that a lot of men with low-risk disease were being treated unnecessarily. It's a common phenomenon in cancer right now that we have such good detection strategies for all cancers that we're picking up a lot of cancers which would never be a problem if left undetected or, uh, or not treated, a problem called overdetection. So it's occurring in prostate cancers, thyroid cancer, breast cancer. We even see pancreatic and even lung cancer now. We do all the screening. We something to pick up things which should never be a problem, and that risk is compounded when you treat it unnecessarily, something called overdetection. So the task force said not only do the randomized trials show no good evidence of an effect, uh, there's too much so-called overtreatment. Now, uh, two things happened, uh, uh, and this is a screening kind of a very brief summary. So again, 1990s, 2000s, prostate cancer screening was implemented poorly. That means we were screening a lot of patients, screening older men, frequently with a lot of comorbidity. I have other diseases which not benefit from screening. We were over rescreening them. We were treating low risk disease unnecessarily. Interestingly enough, high risk disease was undertreated. Uh, but despite all this, mortality rates declined 50%. So the, we felt the, the answer was not to, to screen none, but to screen, to screen starter, uh, smarter. And here at UCSF, we were, over the last 20 years, we've been moving towards smarter screening. And I'm going to show you uh, what we did, and I think others did as well. Now, the task force actually changed the recommendation, and this task force was actually led by one of our distinguished professors here at UCSF, the chair of uh, epidemiology and biostatistics, uh, Kristen Bibbins-Domingo. 
And she took it over, and there were two important uh, things that made them change to a C, which means a C recommendation means it recommends individualized decision-making about screening. That means you talk to your patient about the risks and benefits. Uh, so it's a significant change from a D, which was no screening. And they made this change, in my opinion, on two, uh, two important points. And um, I was, uh, had the opportunity to uh, review the guidelines before they went out and actually comment on them. One was they realized that the American study on screening was very flawed. So in Europe, it was, it was a true test. The men, one, men got, one group of men got PSA tests and one didn't. But what they found in the U.S. trial was that it was supposed to be PSA in one group and no PSA in another. But it turns out the, in, the, in the control group, probably about 85% of men actually got PSAs done by the end of school. So it was actually a, a study of early versus delayed screening. It, it wasn't a good screening study. And actually, when they've re-looked at the study in more, more uh, uh, carefully, the reductions in mortality are very similar to what they saw in the European trial. So they, they said, gee, now we look at the data again, the evidence is a little clearer that there may be a benefit to, um, to screening and it may reduce prostate cancer sp uh, specific uh, deaths. The other thing I pointed out to them, which we, st uh, which we had, a, I think, a, a major role in, is that urologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists were no longer over-treating prostate cancer to the extent that they were before. So here at UCSF 20 years ago, we started an active surveillance population, and we have one of the world's biggest series of so-called active surveillance where we took lowest men and didn't treat them and showed that those outcomes were very good. So on the one hand, we were showing that the cancer detection can have a benefit in some patients. On the other hand, we were showing that some of those patients detected with disease didn't need treatment. So those are two important, I think, things that um, pushed them to change the recommendation from a D to a C. Actually, the highest rates of active surveillance for lower disease in the United States are right here in San Francisco, um, which we, we take great pride in, actually. So the rationale for screening is a burdensome disease when detected late. There's no cure yet for very late stage disease, but it's been remarkable over the last 15 years, you know, five new drugs approved. Uh, this is becoming a disease which we're trying to turn into a chronic disease rather than a death sentence. Uh, screening detects disease at an earlier stage, so if you wait to develop, men develop symptoms, it's usually very, very advanced cancer, very more difficult to treat. And screening and early treatment of some men reduces the risk of dying of prostate cancer somewhere between 21 and 48%. So I think there's a rationale for it. But the important questions for all of you when you think about prostate cancer screening and treatment is the first one is, should I be screened? If you undergo screening and you have cancer, do you need to be treated? That's very important. So about 40% of the men currently being detected with prostate cancer don't need treatment. If you want to be treated, how should you be treated? If you're treated, what you can expect? Not only with regard to cancer cure, but side effects. I've told you the prostate cancer sits down near some very important structures, so it can have side effects if you treat it. So when you screen for prostate cancer, generally you take a history, age, family history, ethnicity, what's your diet, symptoms. Digital rectal examination is optional. Uh, option, optional is a, it's an exam that men hate to have. I, can, I understand that. Uh, uh, and actually, it's not a very good screening uh, study to do. Getting a serum PSA test is actually has more value of getting a blood test than doing the digital rectal examination. If you have an elevated PSA, it should be confirmed, so you should get another test done just to be sure it's truly elevated, because sometimes we see these false positives. If you have an elevated PSA, then you should have an examination of the prostate. In the past, what you did is you went right to something called a transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy. So this is an ultrasound here. Here's the rectum man's right side, left side here. This is the prostate gland right here. This dark area here is classic for prostate cancer, so you can go ahead and make a diagnosis by taking. This is done under local anesthesia in a doctor's office. So I lead the, the National Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Network's guidelines. This is actually the most popular guideline in the U.S., and I think it takes a very balanced approach. So we support early detection in well-informed, healthy men. We believe a baseline test should be done at age 45. A lot of guidelines suggest age 55, but it turns out a PSA test at age 45 is a strong predictor not only of your future risk of getting a prostate cancer, but of your future risk of getting lethal prostate cancer. So we think an early, an early test see what it is, and then do less frequent testing based on that. But the median PSA for a man between 45 and 50 is uh, 0.7. So for younger patients, you, you want a PSA less than one. As you get older and your prostate gets larger, the, the PSAs can go higher. 
Uh, there are some men who have a family history of disease. These are men who have family history of breast cancer, mother or father, especially early age of onset, BRCA1 or 2, ovarian, pancreatic uh, uh, cancer. First degree relatives who get prostate cancer, especially lethal disease at an early age, these men should be screened for what we call germline abnormalities. These are these inherited diseases like BRCA1 or 2. There's about 12 of them now. Uh, we still don't know, you know, the, the, the screening studies were done, Caucasian men, so we really still don't know the optimal screening uh, that uh, for men with high-risk patients we call African-American men or men with a family history. We think those men should be screened differently, probably a little bit more carefully, earlier age. One big change was that I told you the randomized trials use PSA alone as an indication to do biopsy. And I'll show you why that may be a problem. So in the last two rounds of this, we said there may be alternatives to routine biopsy. If not elevated PSA, you could have a biopsy, but there may be other ways to determine whether or not you have clinically significant cancer and biopsy those men alone. And then the, the, the important thing is with screening, you have to consider active surveillance in men identified to have low risk disease. If you don't understand that, 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 not all men, that not all men need to be treated, then you shouldn't, in my opinion, be screening. Um, this is the problem with screening. So what I'm showing you, this is called a pictogram, and these are 1,000 US men. And if you screen these men, you will reduce deaths, you will, you will save about uh, f uh, four to five men from dying of prostate cancer. The problem with the downstream harm. So if you do PSA testing of these 1,000 men, about 250 will have an elevated PSA. If you biopsy those patients, about 130 will have a negative biopsy. We call it false positive. They probably just had large prostates. So they, they didn't need the, the biopsy. About 120 will have a positive biopsy, but about half of those will have these low-risk tumors which did not need to be detected because they don't need to be treated. There's about eight complications of biopsy or treatment. If you treat these cancers, uh, even using surveillance, there are adverse consequences in urinary function, sexual function, bowel function. So there's a lot of adverse consequences of, of routine biopsy. So one thing we consider that, well, instead of going to a biopsy in all patients, are there tests that you can use to determine which men are harboring clinically significant disease and only biopsy those patients? And there are these tests available today. I'm just showing you some of these right here. These are about six of them. They're, they're, they're blood tests or urine tests, and they're, they're uh, frequently we call isoforms of PSA, but there are a lot of them out there. And you can have an elevated PSA, confirm it's elevated, and then you can use one of these tests, urine or blood, to determine what is your risk of having higher risk disease. And frequently they'll give you a percent, like a 15% or 20%. So you can make an informed decision about whether to go biopsy or not. The other test that's becoming very common uh, in the US and very common in Europe now is something called a multi-parametric MRI scan. This is an MRI, coronal section. This patient's, it's a, a scan looking this way. You're looking at the front of the patient. Here's their right hip, their left hip. These, this is the, the bladder up in here. This is the prostate gland right here. Here's the pelvic floor muscles, prostate gland right here. And this right here, this dark structure, is very consistent with the prostate cancer. So, this does the same thing the markers do, determines who's at risk for having clinical significant disease, but at the same time what it does allows you to do, we have the technology now, in the past when you did these biopsies, you kind of did them randomly, you know, right, left, base, mid gland, and, and apex, they weren't targeted, but we have the technology, as does others now, where we can actually fuse this image with the ultrasound image and call, do what we call a fusion biopsy. So we can target the prostate very carefully. And what you do by that is you, decrease the likelihood that you could miss a clinically significant cancer. So frequently now what we'll do, and certainly here at UCSF, if we have a patient with an elevated PSA confirmed, we won't go right to a biopsy. We'll do one of these serum or urine tests and frequently an MRI scan. And only those patients we think have clinically significant disease will go ahead and consider a biopsy. And we'll be able to give patients a relative risk. We'll be able to give them an idea what's the likelihood that they have clinically significant cancer and they can make an informed decision. Uh, so the way we save early detection is, again, the target population, healthy men and that don't do a lot of rescreenings. We stop screening at low PSA. So if you're in your early 60s and have a PSA below 1, your future risk of having disease is very low. You may be able to stop screening. And at age 75, that may be a PSA of 3. We used to screen at yearly intervals, but actually now you can go between 2 and 4 years. And now we have more stringent indications for biopsy. Again, using these markers of increased specificity. The other thing which we think is very important is if you have lower disease, don't treat those patients, but uh, consider active surveillance. Because even if you use these tests, you still pick up some men with very low-risk cancers. Um, 
And again, these are on all these guidelines now. This is showing you that if you have patients with low intermediate risk disease, you can consider active surveillance. So all the guidelines now in the U.S. and Europe recognize this. You can talk about surgery, you can talk about radiation therapy, but active, active surveillance is another option for these patients with low risk disease. Uh, this is the result at, at UCSF. Again, we have the, one of the largest series in the world here on active surveillance. And this is the likelihood of requiring treatment at five years if you're on active surveillance. And it's about 30%, 50% by 10 years. Uh, in this population, uh, the overall survival is 98%. Prostate cancer specific survival, 100%. Turns out that at UCSF, whether I treat these men right away or I watch them, they get worse and treat them later, there's no difference in outcome. And I'm one of the busiest surgeons in the world here, and I strongly feel that active surveillance for the lowest patients is a good thing to do. So I think that's an important point there. So if you're found to have prostate cancer, uh, don't rush. This is a, if, you, if you ask men, the single thing that they complain about a year after their diagnosis and treatment is they felt they, they went to treatment too fast. Very rarely does a pr prostate cancer need to be treated right away. That, that, that's, you know, one in 100, one in 200. Get educated. You need to understand this disease better. Be sure testing and evaluation is complete. It's amazing to me the number of patients that I see that have not had an adequate evaluation. I said to a reporter the other day, I, I'm completely comfortable with decisions that men make, but they, meet, they need to make them on the best information available to them, and frequently they don't, they don't get that information. Understand all your options, surgery, radiation, ablation, hormonal therapy. I think it's very important to ask your doctor, do you need treatment? It's amazing to me the number of patients who are good candidates for surveillance when no one talked to them about it. Uh, I think you need to get opinions from experienced people and centers. Uh, consider a support group. We have some great support groups in the, in the Bay Area here. Uh, and a diagnosis is a teachable moment. I always point out to people the, the, number, the, uh, the number one, uh, let me go right to you, the, the, the uh, number, one of, uh, number one cause of, of, of death in men with prostate cancer and women with prostate cancer is not breast or prostate cancer, it's cardiovascular disease, it's a teachable moment. We've done a lot of work on looking at the impact of diet, nutrition, and exercise on cancer diagnosis. We have great publications. If you go to the UCSF uh, urology website, we have great books on diet and nutrition. We have nutritionists available. We have some clinical trials of both diet and nutrition. But we have found that patients can uh, transform their lives um, by adopting uh, a um, better diet and, and um, exercise. Even if, they even if they require treatment, we have some, some data that suggests that those men who adopt a healthy lifestyle have a lower risk of recurrence after treatment compared to men that, that have not. And of course, uh, it allows patients to tolerate the treatment better. I just want to let you know that there's rapid advances being made here at UCSF. I'm showing you on one side here a genetic profile of a low-risk cancer. These are genetically very heterogeneous tumors. We're learning from that. We're learning which tumors respond to what therapy. And uh, UCSF has been a leader in the U.S. for the use of something called PSMA PET. This is a, one of the problems with staging of prostate cancer is you, you can't identify disease elsewhere because it's so small you'll miss it by standard imaging. And this is technology I saw uh, when I was traveling and I felt we needed to have a UCSF. Tom Hope leads the program and both UCSF and UCLA are bringing this technology to the FDA. They met with the FDA in August. But this is a test which is really, I think, is, is uh, revolutionizing um, the way we uh, diagnose and treat this disease. So what I'm showing you here are that those bright spots are, are some of the isotope in the bowel, but you see these little arrows are popping up showing us lymph nodes that would not be detected otherwise. Uh, they're quite small. We wouldn't have found it otherwise. This is a patient from Mexico City who came to see me. And actually, he had gone through numerous biopsies, and they'd missed it. And you'll see this cancer pop up here on uh, PSMA PEC technology. You see it coming right down here a tumor that was missed. Uh, and those lymph nodes were too small to uh, actually uh, see by conventional imaging. So the take home message again, consider screening PSA tests if you're in good health and certainly if you are in a higher risk group, strong family history, ethnicity, start age 50 or at average risk. I think again, starting age 45 is important. Um, after discussion about screening, for those men who want to be screened, they should be tested with PSA test. If it's elevated, confirm it, get another one done. I would do a digital rectal examination if the PSA is elevated. Uh, I would consider a secondary test rather than going right to biopsy. So again, one of these serum or urine markers, maybe an MRI. If your PSA is normal for your age, I think frequency of testing is somewhere between one and four years based, based on risk. Um, don't rush, understand all your options, get well informed, seek opinions, ask questions, and again, lead a healthy life, eat uh, well and exercise. 
Uh, for those who have more information, I have them here. You'll see it on the slides available to you. This is a book produced by the American Urological Association, uh, and that's available online. I actually edit the, uh, the UC Berkeley had the prostate disorders, a very nice book. Uh, the 2019 edition is coming out. That can be ordered online as well. I think these are good resources. But if you go, you know, the American Cancer Society, um, there's a lot of good, Prostate Cancer Foundation, a lot of good resources online. Thank you very much, and I'll take some questions. So the, the question is, the, uh, the, there was perceived to be a high complication rate from prostate biopsies, and does that uh, occur with other cancers? The, actually, the, the uh, uh, significant complication rate from biopsy, prostate biopsy is actually quite low, 1 to 2 percent. It can be higher in some patients, especially those who undergo repeat biopsies, because you can develop a, since they're frequently done transrectally, you can develop fairly resistant bacteria, but it's about 1 to 2 percent. But bi unnecessary biopsies should be avoided for other reasons as well. You know, they're costly, no one really likes them. Now, we are looking at different ways to do biopsies. One, instead of going transrectally, is you go with something called transperineally. We're also quite interested in technology which suggests that you may be able to pick up the DNA of the tumor in a urine sample, where you can even avoid a biopsy altogether. Now, all biopsies have potential complications, uh, but they may be different. So if you're biopsying a central structure uh, in the body, uh, where you can get bleeding and other things. But generally, biopsies, when done well, have a low risk of significant uh, side effects. But no one really likes a biopsy. So the question is, uh, uh, your brother in Mexico had uh, something done to treat his prostate cancer, it began with an O, and it's called orchiectomy. Thank you. Okay. And orchiectomy, uh, and someone well, won the Nobel Prize for understanding that prostate cancer is a hormonally sensitive disease. So when you lower testosterone levels, the tumors shrink. They don't go away, but they shrink sometimes very significantly and sometimes for many years. Well, one way to do that is to remove the testicles, which are the major source of, of testosterone. And it was a common way to treat prostate cancer many years ago. Uh, nowadays, we have medications which, which can do the same thing. They usually use an injection we call LHRH agonists or antagonists. Now, the value is uh, no one warms up to the idea of getting the testicles taken off. But, but um, <laughs> the, the value is that some men are actually candidates for something called intermittent hormonal therapy. So these, are these, these men who may have uh, limited uh, metastases, and certainly some men suffer with hormonal therapy quite a bit. So usually we don't do orchiectomy anymore. We try with these medications first, see how they respond and tolerate it. If they tolerate it well and, and they, they are going to be on lifelong hormonal therapy, then I would consider an orchiectomy. But some men, we could do something called intermittent hormonal therapy where we treat them for a 9 to 12 to 24, uh, 9 to 12 months stop and then retreat them should their PSA rise. So for men with lower risk metastatic disease, that actually is a fairly good option to call intermittent hormonal therapy because their testosterone comes back up during those off periods. They feel a little bit better on it. The side effects of hormonal therapy could be significant for men. Short term, not, but long term, you know, loss of muscle mass, centripetal weight gain, cognitive issues, uh, bone mineral density changes. So we're, we're very cautious with it uh, now. Yeah, so the, the question is what's the purpose and essentiality? Uh, the, why, why do we have one? Well, the reason we have one because it, pro it provides for seminal secretions that are important for fertility. So these are secretions that. that uh, that allow for fertility. So they, they make a, a more hospitable environment for the sperm cells. Sperm cells are a small component of the, of the ejaculate volume. So actually, after uh, uh, child rearing, you don't need it. You, you, but you, you, have to be, you don't want to just take it out prophylactically because there's a lot of important structures around it. But it's, the purpose is really uh, in fertility uh, uh, management. Correct. So, so uh, the, the whole issue is, is, is frequency relatively common as you get older, and the answer is yes. It probably relates something to the prostate, either tone or size. And to the extent that, that, that men are bothered by it, and, and the, the natural history is quite variable. Some men, this is like a slow, steady change. Um, and actually, what I want to point out, there is a correlation between size and symptoms, but it's not exact. So I'll see many men who have a very large prostate and very few symptoms, where I see someone with a small price and a lot of symptoms. But it's a consequence uh, of aging and probably related to the prostate. I think the, the natural history is, is variable. And you know, look, uh, you know, in life, there's a certain amount of pain and suffering, and you just need to understand how is it a problem or it's not a problem. I, you know, I think behavioral therapy, I, don't, I wouldn't rush to do medication. You know, time voiding, getting used to it is a real problem or not.
Great question. So when you take the drugs that reduce prostate volume, do you need to take them for life? The answer is no, but of course, once you stop, the prostate may, may regrow with time. But I've had some men who will, will stop for a while and, and see what, how long it takes to uh, regrow. But generally, you, you t as long as you're taking it, you'll decrease prostate volume. When you stop taking it, the prostate will regrow but at variable rate. So I've actually had some men uh, do intermittent uh, therapy with that. Now, again, the PSA level will drop by about 50%, and that's fine. It's just a new baseline. So you can still, many people are concerned that if you take these drugs, drops PSA, can you still detect prostate cancer? And the answer is yes, you just have a new baseline. Great question. I'm not sure I have the answer. So the question is, so how long does it take uh, when you take a glass of water that you'll excrete that in the urine? I think it depends a little bit on your, your hydration status. That means are you tanked up or not? So I do a lot of running. There are some days I'm going to have to drink. I ran the Boston Marathon one year, and I was so dehydrated at the end that I, I, I was worried my kidney shut down. I, I mean, I drank and drank. It probably took me two hours to make the first drop of urine. So I think it depends a little bit on your, uh, you know, how hydrated you are. And Jeff may know the answer to that more than I do, but it, it, I, think it, uh, I think it depends on, on how hydrated you are. So if you're very hydrated, I think you'll have a, a, a quicker effect because, you know, you do make urine continuously. So what I usually, so the, when do I recommend people slow down? It's usually after dinner. So it's that, you know, between, after 6 to 7 p.m., slow down. The other thing I tell men to do before bedtime is to double void. So go, and then 10 minutes later, go again. Because sometimes when you have a residual urine, what you're doing is you, you're topping it off. So sometimes if you go, and then 10 minutes later, go again, you'll actually get more urine out, so double voiding. I also tell men, frequently, the men develop symptoms uh, when they're doing these long plane rides. So I tell men who have prostate symptoms, get an aisle seat, get up and go, limit alcohol, and don't wait to go. Do time voiding and um, limit alcohol in planes. It's very common that men will get in trouble on these long plane flights. Let me come into the last question first. So as you get older, it takes longer to start. And, that, and what's happening there, that's true, because what your uh, bladder is doing is generating enough pressure to overcome the fixed outlet resistance for the prostate. So what you're doing is you're building pressure uh, you know, it's like my grandson, you know, he hits the toilet, he's done in seconds. Uh, but but uh, as you prostate enlarges, you need to develop, you know, that pro the, you need to develop enough pressure to uh, overcome the outlet resistance. So that's what's happening there. I think the other thing is, if again, time voiding is important because it's, it's, if you wait to go, it's o there'll always be a bigger problem. And part of that may be the fact that the bladder is having a hard time generating enough uh, energy when it gets uh, distended a bit. So it's frequently common that men will say, well, look, when I waited to, waited to go, I really had to wait a bit to, to get going. So again, time voiding. The, the issue about uh, prostate cancer treatment, there's a lot of different options. And in some cases, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, and we try and tell this to patients. So a place like UCSF, is, we don't do one thing. We do everything from dietary therapy, large surgical. I have a lot of people come to me for surgery, but we have talented radiation oncologists. And I point that for most patients, they're going to have many options. And the options will be based on their own personal preferences about one option versus another. What we're struggling with is about 25 to 30 percent of men who have very high-risk tumors who are really searching to the best treatment strategy for those patients. But for many men, uh, they can have a good outcome a lot of different ways. And we try and explain that to them so they understand it quite, uh, uh, quite clearly. So you make decisions based on uh, some, some criteria. But again, this is, again, understanding all, uh, all your options. At UCSF, most patients will see a surgeon, see a radiation oncologist. So it's just not one person managing their symptoms. So great questions. Uh, let me answer the, try and answer the second one first. If you, if, you, if, com, if you combine the medication with behavioral therapy, my sense is you'll do better. Now, that hasn't been tested, the combination, but my sense is you'll do better. Do yeah, so I, I, would, I, I would, again, time void. I would, do, I would do all the behavioral things, you know, time voiding. Um, you know, again, the, the, the uh, Kegels, it's, it's just, it's, uh, some people find it helpful, some don't. The combined medication, both an alpha blocker and a foul reductase inhibitor, is most uh, successful for men who have a large prostate because it, both, it decreases tone and size. And uh, it is likely it's going to work. And what you do but when you take that compared to taking a control drug, you will decrease by, by 50 to 80 percent the likelihood that you develop one of these adverse outcomes. I think that one of the, the keys is, is, is there are side effects. So that's the other thing. It can be effective, but there may be side effects with it. So some men find the side effects uh, very troublesome. And even though it may be effective, if the side effects are troublesome, they may not be satisfied. 
but they, but they, they work. We, we, but we start with an alpha blocker first. It, it, it is not. It's not. So what I do think, if you're going to have surgery for, for benign enlargement and you're, and you're healthy, I would consider screening of some type. And the reason for that is if you were found to have cancer, the way you would treat the benign enlargement may be different. So, so I think for men who are undergoing a surgical procedure, I think those patients, uh, it, it is wise, in my opinion, to con if they're healthy, to consider uh, screening them ahead of time, determine whether they do or don't have prostate cancer, because the way you would treat them would be different uh, or, or, or could be different based on that knowledge. And uh, some of the BPH therapies can compromise your ability to get effective treatment for prostate cancer. So the side effects of radiation therapy are greater in men who've had a, a previous transurethral section. So I think for men whose symptoms are significant enough to, to consider surgical therapy, if they're healthy, I, I would screen them first. It doesn't, doesn't need to be, have a biopsy, however. So if your PSA is low, the drug examination is low, secondary tests are low, then I don't think you need a biopsy. So the, the question was the, the, uh, the side effects of taking these, uh, these drugs, Cialis, you know, there's, uh, there's a Cialis, uh, Levitra, and uh, Viagra. Uh, and these drugs actually work quite well. Uh, what you need to be careful is in men who have uh, cardiac disease or because um, it can lower blood pressure. And for men on, uh, who have uh, angina, should not be taking these drugs. So we always ask men to talk to their doctors about it. They're actually very effective drugs. Uh, they, they do have side effects. Men may complain of you know, facial flushing, uh, sometimes a blue cast, because uh, you know, it does have an effect uh, on the retina. Uh, but they're actually very effective drugs. And so I think for, uh, for a, a couple uh, that are struggling with the sexual function, it's actually a very good way to, uh, to improve things. So I think you have to watch out for, the, for men who have a, a baseline cardiac disorder, but they're very, uh, uh, I think, very functional. You know, if you go, again, if you go to a website, we have a little booklet on sexual function, tells you more about erections than you ever needed to know, but it actually goes through all the drugs. The shorter acting drugs are uh, Viagra and Levitra. Viagra you should take on an empty stomach. Levitra you can take after eating but not a fatty meal. Um, and Salus is a longer acting drug in general. Um, um, uh, they do have a daily dose, as I mentioned. They can be expensive. Uh, we, uh, if you talk to your provider, I think the, 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 um, our patients get access to, to uh, much reduced prices. Yeah. And, you, and I always tell people to start out with half a dose. So don't, you, know, you want your doctor to order you the full dose because the price is the same and you cut them in half. So start with a low dose. Uh, what I'll do is I'll stay around if there are any additional questions. I want to thank everyone for coming. It's been wonderful.